Great. Thank you, Datsy. Well, good morning. My name is Ed Tullock, and I'm one of the team here. Great to be with you. Uh, this week, we have a, a new feature that I'd like to share with you to help you engage with the talk. Um, as Datsy said, it's, it's a somewhat complex topic, so um, I thought this might be helpful just to, to try out. I've prepared a, a handout, basically, that you can use on your phone, so you can use it through the app or online. You can either go through the app uh, to the Respond tab, and then Most Recent Sermon Notes button, and that will open a page, or you can go to hopecityedinburgh.org forward slash notes. And on there is the sermon outline and some extra things at the bottom that you can look into things a bit further if you'd like to, because you won't have time to cover everything in depth just now. There's also, for those who are into this, some fill in the blanks. So that's a lot of fun. If you get bored, just try and guess the word. Um, so um, have a look at that, um, and uh, let me know what you think of it. Now, I'm just going to adjust this a bit, because it's loosening off. There we go. Wonderful. Well, last week, um, Luke unpacked for us part of Jesus' teaching, helping us to see that only Jesus provides true rest. This is what he said. Jesus proclaimed, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I guess the question is, is this guy for real? Is he for real? Not Luke, uh, this is Jesus. It is Jesus for real. He offers lasting, satisfying rest for those who come to him. All who are burdened and wearisome in the face of difficulties. We've read about some of them in those prayer requests. Some really hard stuff going on in our church family. Is Jesus actually going to pull through with this? Rest for those in the rat race of life. Worn out. Wondering if this is it. Well, Jesus claims to have the answer, but will he follow through? Is his claim like those counterfeit money launderers that criminals smuggle through customs and things, offering wealth, that money that offers wealth, but actually it's just a bit of worthless paper. That money looks like the real deal, but when you dig a bit deeper, it's just phony. Is Jesus' offer of rest the same as that? Pretty on the outside, but actually pretty worthless when push comes to shove. Jesus says, come to me, all you here weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Well, as we said, Luke helped us see last week that Jesus invites us to come to him, and he has a posture of open arms, not a pointed finger, like that of the Pharisees, the religious celebrities of the time. And Liz is going to come up and read for us just now. And So not that Liz, other Liz. Yeah. <laughs> Both sitting next to each other. That was scary, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and we're going to see what that counterfeit rest looks like and how Jesus' offer matches up to it. So we're going to read from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. It's on page 977 in the Church Bibles. <coughs> At that time, Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some ears of corn and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on the Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Liz. Well, the climax of this passage is Jesus claiming something about himself, who he is, in verse 8. Verses 1 to 7 lead up to it, and verses 9 to 14 flow from it. He says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, some strange terms here. Who is Lord of what? What's going on? Well, well, he uses the term the Son of Man, which is a way of referring to himself, and relates to an ancient prophecy um, written to the Israelite people by a prophet called Daniel many, many years ago. And that said that the promised Son of Man has the authority of the Lord God and rules an everlasting kingdom. Now, Jesus claims to be that promised king every time he used this term about himself. So that's the who. What's the what? Well, well, the Sabbath was the day of rest, commanded by God that Jewish people still follow today. Now, when Jesus says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, the religious leaders were outraged because they knew who he was claiming to be. And their plans are laid out for us to read in verse 14 in response to this. They say, the Pharisees plotted to kill Jesus. Seems a bit steep, doesn't it? Well, to understand, we need to back up a bit and explore what this idea of the Sabbath really meant to these people before we zoom back into today's passage and draw some applications out for us today. So, second, what is the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath is a Hebrew word meaning rest. It was a command of God to his people to rest on the seventh day of the week. That's the Saturday. And the first time that God overtly commands the Israelites to observe the Sabbath is in Exodus chapter 16, just after he's rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. And he miraculously provides daily water and food for them in the desert every morning. And he says to them, tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So he says, kind of collect double the amount that you, had, you need on the Saturday so you don't have to do anything, any work on the Sunday. Sorry, other way around. On the Friday, this is Saturday, so <laughs> on the Friday night, uh, Friday morning, collect double what you need. Saturday, don't do anything. Now, there are a few reasons why the Lord appears to do this. Here are three verses uh, that pick out some of the big ones. In, uh, Ezek- in uh, Exodus later, oh, sorry, I've lost. There we go. Ezekiel. Uh, we read, Therefore I led them out of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my decrees, although also I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us, so they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. So to be holy, part of the reason that the Sabbath was given to the Israelite people would be that, the Lord, that they would know that the Lord had made them holy or set apart, distinctive from the other nations around them. Now, another reason is explained when the Sabbath law is restated as part of the Ten Commandments, the laws which uh, God gave to his people uh, when they were wandering in the wilderness. And he says this, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, and on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the Sabbath in some way honored God's work of creation and remembered the rest that he had following that. Third reason um, is given to those Israelites in the, uh, the further restating of the Ten Commandments, next book of the Bible. He says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. The Sabbath helped God's people to remember they were redeemed by God as he rescued them from slavery in Egypt. So holy, honoring creation, and remembering that they are redeemed. Three reasons for the Sabbath that we see in God's word. But there's actually an even bigger system than rest, than just this weekly thing. The people um, wandering in the wilderness that we talked about there, they were headed towards a promised land. And when they got there, God God had prepared this land for them. and And he asked them, he said, every seven years, the land is to have rest. No crops to be grown or planted or reaped. And every seven times seven years, that's every after 50, after 49 years. Oh, I should have got some mental maths. Seven times seven, 49. Um, so on the 50th year, all leased lands were to be returned to their owners and all slaves were to be set free. There was rest for the whole nation, the whole land. 
Now, these laws were radical for the time and certainly would have been a very distinctive witness of God's holy people to the world around them in, of their trust in him as their creator and their redeemer. Now, I say it would have been a, a, a distinctive witness because they don't seem to have actually kept those laws very well. We've got no record that the freeing of land and slaves ever happened on those 50-year marks. In fact, their failure to observe the Sabbath system is given as one key reason for God sending them out of the nation, that the land that they were in, into exile. And he sent them away for the exact number of years that was due for all the missed Sabbaths that the land was due to have. So all of this, if you've zoomed out, we're back in, all of this is to say the Sabbath is a big deal, <laughs> big deal for these Israelite people. Fast forward to the time of Jesus, and Israelites are back in the promised land again. God's brought them back. And so the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time, are really, really eager to protect it. So much so, they've made 39 extra rules around the Sabbath to make sure that they didn't accidentally break the law. And they basically said, no one can do any of these things. And I'm sorry to say to everyone here, that included home baking. <laughs> no baking on the Sabbath. Now, Christians have a very complex relationship with the idea of the Sabbath. Um, and true Christians understand this issue very differently in how it plays out for us today. And in this church family, we have a mix of views on that, and that's absolutely fine. And we try to practice something called theological generosity, which is where we aim to have unity with, with and respect for other people other followers of Jesus who hold different positions on some of these secondary matters that aren't core to our faith. And this issue is definitely one of those secondary issues. In fact, we're told that later in the Bible, in Colossians. It says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, or a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. So there we go. Secondary issue. Don't be judged by it. So what follows flows from how I understand the Bible to speak about the Sabbath, because that's the only way I can speak with conviction in what I'm saying. Um, but I recognize that other people have different, different positions, and I truly welcome people to ask questions about this as we interact later. Um, I am 100% sure that I'm not 100% right on 100% of my theology, so do, do ask away. We all bring assumptions to any text we read, and so we need to keep coming back to God's word, scripture, to sharpen our understanding together, and that's one of the wonderful things about being together. We need to get what is God's absolute truth, what is helpful tradition, and what is meaningless trash, and, and kind of distinguish those based on what we read in the Bible. So, looking at Old Testament laws to the Jewish people requires us to interpret them through the world-changing events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And, and that makes sense, doesn't it? We read about various things in the Old Testament that we recognize as limited to that time um, of history, like temple sacrifices and food laws. In some ways, it's uh, maybe strange, dangerous territory here, but it's a bit like the EU and the UK relationship to massively oversimplify things. Um, at one point we were in history, we were bound to obey EU law, um, and that was good and proper to do at the time. Our circumstances have changed somewhat, um, and uh, we don't need to do that anymore, but we can still recognize wisdom in some of those laws as well. Um, now, Jesus repeatedly claims to have fulfilled different elements of the Old Testament laws given to the Jewish people. And we actually read in the previous chapter of Matthew, that's the reason that he came, to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, but to fulfill it. Now that verse we read earlier from Colossians carries on. It says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These, these things we just said, including the Sabbath day, are a shadow of the thing to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So in some sense, the Sabbath system was designed to point to Jesus Christ. And that, I think, is the main point Jesus is trying to make of this passage. So, Lord of the Sabbath. What leads Jesus to make this claim that he is Lord of the Sabbath? Well, it's sparked off by his followers. They're, they're walking through a grain field. Imagine the scene, nice Saturday morning, beautiful morning. And Jesus and his followers, are, are, are including Matthew, our writer here, uh, they find themselves in a grain field, and they've not eaten all morning, they're a bit peckish, uh, and they spot some unharvested crops along the side of the field. And they grind a little grain in their hands, as they mun and they munch, munch, munch as they go. Basically, first century equivalent of a snack. I'm afraid no grain is being handed out today. Um, but the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees, they spot them doing this, and they say, Aha! 
we see what you're doing. You're breaking our laws around the Sabbath. Item number 27, do not pluck heads of grain. This is against the law. And you, Jesus, you are responsible as their leader. It's like they made themselves lords of the Sabbath themselves, deciding what is allowed and what isn't allowed so they could look down their super spiritual noses on everyone else and give themselves a good pat on the back. Well, notice Jesus hasn't actually done anything wrong here. It's his disciples who have been plucking grain. He wasn't. Um, even that wasn't necessarily wrong. Now, it would have been easy for him just to throw them under the bus and get away from the controversy and find a new group of people. But he uses the Pharisees' accusation here to teach them about him and to teach his disciples about him and to teach us today about him. He makes a progressive argument, bringing together loads of different elements of the Old Testament scriptures, which the Pharisees knew very well. I imagine we probably know less well. Um, so we're going to do a brief overview um, to bear with us as we, as we fly through some of these, these ideas um, of Jesus' argument as he draws on different parts of the, of the um, Old Testament. So, G- I, I'm basically, sorry, it, it basically hinges on being Jesus is greater than everything that we're reading about. He fulfills everything. So firstly, Jesus is greater than David. Verse 3 and 4, Jesus answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, only for the priests. Now this account uh, Jesus mentions here is about an ancient Jewish leader called King David, the same David who fought Goliath as a child, if you know that story. Now God anointed David as king, And it seems his position as God's anointed king gave him authority to interpret the law correctly. He saw God's heart in giving a law which prohibited other people from eating this this consecrated or special holy bread. And he recognized actually in mercy for his men who were starving fugitives on the run, who hadn't eaten for days and days and days, that God mercifully provides food. David saw this as a provision. And Jesus uses that as an example. Very different situation from the uh, his disciples, who, who aren't starving, they're just a bit peckish. Um, I don't think that's really the link here. I, th- I think it's more about who David is. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, surely you Bible scholars are well acquainted with the story of 1 Ta- Samuel 21. David is a su- spiritual hero, and he allowed his disciples to suspend some of the restrictions of the, this law in order to show mercy. And so in making this argument to defend his disciples, who he claims are innocent, he's highlighting that one greater than David is here, who has the authority to determine how the Sabbath law applies. But he moves on to the next step in the argument. But, so next step, so David, Jesus is greater than David. Jesus is greater than the temple. Verse 5 and 6. Um, or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Again, he gently prods them. Uh, haven't you, experts in the scriptures, read about those very scriptures that say what the priests have to do on the Sabbath? And he's speaking about all the various roles the priests had to do on the Sabbath day. They certainly weren't resting. They were working uh, really hard, actually, harder than the rest of the week. And yet this was God's command for them to work. So if the service of the temple could make such work on the Sabbath legitimate, how much more can something greater than the temple, as he calls himself. Jesus is saying here, I am greater than the temple. And I say, this is good. Okay, so Jesus is greater than David. He's greater than the temple. Next up, verse 7, Jesus is greater than ceremony. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would would not have condemned the innocent, that is, his disciples. Now, Jesus appeals to a prophet, Hosea, who wrote about 500 years before the time of Jesus. Uh, And and he's saying they haven't understood the purposes of the law. Because Hosea continues, and when when Hosea writes, he says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God, rather than burnt offerings. Now, Jesus wanted the Pharisees not just to perform the religious duties, the sacrifices, the offerings, but actually to live in line with God's merciful ways. He wanted their hearts to be transformed by knowing God. Mercy, not sacrifice. This, fr- this phrasing can be quite confusing. It sounds like he doesn't actually want any of the stuff that he asked, uh, asked them to do. Um, it's not so much the idea of God wants X and not, he doesn't want Y. Um, it's more he wants X 
more than Y, X over Y, and mercy more than sacrifice. It's about priorities. Like when my toddler Jess, two-year-old, um, she says, read book, no milk. Um, she's not saying, I don't ever want milk ever again. She's saying, right, I, I really want a book. <laughs> um, and she's a bit of a nerd, I suppose. Um, uh, she, she really wants the book. She also wants milk. Um, so we'll definitely drink that alongside the, the book. Um, she just had an order of priority as to what's most important. The sacrificial system served a purpose, but it wasn't the main thing. The Sabbath served a purpose, but it wasn't the main thing. That main thing, Jesus, is greater than ceremonial observance. And that leads him to say, fourth, Jesus is greater than the Sabbath. This is the climax of the argument, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now this angers the Pharisees because they've set themselves up as lords of the Sabbath themselves, demanding people ha- carry their heavy burdens. But Jesus, who has just been claiming that anyone can come to him and receive his rest, has just demonstrated his claim. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Unlike those ritualistic leaders who overburden even your day of rest to make it unbearable. And then Jesus goes on to reveal their hypocrisy and his act of healing that follows. As Lord of the Sabbath, he is able to do as he wishes on it. So far, he hasn't broken any of their extra Sabbath laws, but he now chooses to to break some of those, the extra ones that the Pharisees have added on. He keeps the the true Sabbath law, but he chooses to break um, the extra ones. He chooses to care for the people around him, to have mercy even when it isn't life-threatening, like this man with a withered hand. It's chronically withered. Probably wait till tomorrow. But he points out their own inconsistency as he does this. And he says, they won't allow for a human's hand to be healed so it can be used again. But they would go and rescue their own animal from a pit. They don't care about the human next to them. They just care about their own stuff. So, Jesus is greater than David. Jesus is greater than the temple. Jesus is greater than religious ceremony. And he's greater than the Sabbath in itself. So what does this all mean for us today? We've had a lot of information. Um, it's a pretty heavy passage with lots of Old Testament stuff coming in. Um, but what does it actually mean? What do we do with this today? Well, it comes down to priorities. The Pharisees' ceremonial observance wasn't wrong in itself. But their heart behind it was Jesus tells these same leaders later on in his gospel, this is what he says in Matthew 23, verse 23, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You see, they were so eager to dot every I and cross every T, they produced a load of extra rules to make sure they kept the rules that they thought the whole thing was about. They wanted a tick-box approach to God's approval. They didn't realize that being friends with the Lord is actually so much simpler than that. Instead of their wearisome and burdensome demands to keep certain laws, Jesus corrects their understanding. We read, he says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You see, Jesus wasn't just greater than all those elements of the Old Testament. He's actually the fulfillment of them, and he fulfills the purposes of the Sabbath too. Remember what we saw earlier? Well, in Jesus, we are holy. We're set apart from the world. In him, we're a new creation made to be a new, new people with him. In him, we can be redeemed, not from slavery in Egypt, um, uh, but from slavery to sin, the word the Bible uses to describe our rebellion against God's ways. And Jesus says, all of you, come to me every day. Come on a Saturday, come on a Sunday, come on a Monday. Come every day of the week. Find your rest in me, not in the burdensome regulations and obligations of man-made religion, of the secular rat race that we all run in, or on the oppressive hierarchy of our society. That's all counterfeit. It's meaningless, pointless. It doesn't deliver. I will give you true rest, true Sabbath. Come to me, not me, Jesus, and be made holy. Come to me and become a new creation. Come to me and be redeemed from sin. Come to me and experience true Sabbath, true everlasting rest. 
So first, he invites anyone who wants to, to find their rest in him. So our response is key. These Pharisees, they went off and tried to find a way to kill him. They rejected the invitation that he makes to them. So I wonder if you're here today and you, and you haven't come to him yourself, please don't reject his invitation to you. That offer is open to you. Just speak to someone near you about how you might do that and what it might mean, or speak to me if, if you prefer. How does that life look for those who come to Jesus as their Sabbath? Well, we see here it means living according to his way with his priorities. Mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy over sacrifice. He corrects those who claim to have come to the Lord but have lost sight of what that is really about. And I've actually found that really helpful these last few weeks as I've been reflecting on my own faith and how that plays out. Jesus desires mercy over sacrifice. He's telling us, don't be so interested in your religion that you forget about relationship. Jesus' desire is for mercy over ceremonial religion. So as you come to him, you receive rest by his mercy. A bit like this torch. I was told to make the light a bit, oh yeah, it's flashing. One, two, three. A bit less bright because it's quite a bright one. Like this torch, you receive mercy. Okay, so this is like God's mercy. And it's shining mercy down on, down on me as someone who's his, his people. But actually, what it should also do is shine out to other people. We should be merciful, reflecting the mercy that we've received from Jesus to other people. Our vertical connection with God should, not, it should produce horizontal love for others. Now, we saw the priority that Jesus places on certain parts of the law. God's heart is for justice, mercy, faithfulness. The stuff we do as part of our religion, like praying, reading the Bible, attending a church gathering, hospitality, giving our time, our resource, all that is good. But it should serve God's bigger purposes, not just a tick box in itself. And that's actually much harder to do than keeping a long list of rules. It desires and needs a new heart. The Pharisees are quick to pick up their rule book and hit people around the head with it, except when their own sheep are stuck in a pit and they will bend their own rules for their own gain. Well, I know my attitude can certainly be like that too. Looking down on someone for not ticking the boxes that I tick in my religion, and yet I'm very quick to give myself a break when and the benefit of the doubt when actually it's an area I find a bit harder, like prayer, for example. I wonder where you are prone to judge people, perhaps other Christians, maybe in church, maybe in other churches, how they dress, how they sing, whether they read widely, widely their politics, their family circumstances, their family behavior, their attendance at a weekly prayer meeting or small group. Well, Jesus says to us to come to me, Come and receive my mercy and share the mercy that I've given you with other people. Encourage them to see that mercy and come to the Lord Jesus themselves rather than beating them over the head with a book of rules that you've made. Well, if you identify with the attitude of the Pharisees, and I imagine that many of us do, then Jesus' invitation is for us to come to me for rest. Rest from judging others. Rest from comparing ourselves to others. Rest from the guilt that we might feel in doing that. Because when we come to him, sorry for these attitudes and willing to change, he does give us a, a new heart. He forgives us, and he gives us power to live out a new way of life. So we're going to pray to him now, trusting in his character and authority to help us in this. So let's pray. Lord of the Sabbath, thank you that you invite us to come to you and experience true rest, not the counterfeit rest offered by man-made structures. We are sorry for the times we want to be lord over others and demand they fit our idea of religion. Please forgive us. Help us to live in light of your priorities and reflect the mercy you offer to those around us. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Over to Ian and band. We're going to respond by singing.
Jesus promises us rest. If you come to him, he promises us rest now, rest from guilt and shame and striving, but also promises an eternal rest that is never going to fade uh, and last forever. And that's the rest that we're going to look forward to in this song. So let's stand and let's lift our eyes toward that eternal rest that we will enjoy in his presence forever. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls.
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ed, for taking the time to explain what you've learned this week. Um, we'll have a look at the questions. There's some really good ones, and there's absolutely no chance we'll get through them all this morning. So if you want to catch Ed afterwards, I'm sure he'd be happy to speak to you. Um, but also, if you want to grab your small group, if you're part of one, or, or anybody this morning, and, and keep digging and finding out for yourself what this means and what it looks like. So first question is... This work? Yes. Is there no Sabbath now? Is it now the nine commandments? So hold on. If there is no Sabbath now, is it now the nine commandments or can we ignore the other nine also? Ah, thank you. <laughs> Great question. It doesn't quite have the same ring, does it? Nine, the nine commandments rather than ten. Um, uh, so I'd say I, I think there is a Sabbath now and that is Jesus. And we come to him for our rest. He is the fulfillment of that. Um, now, interestingly, you mentioned the nine commandments. Um, uh, those are the other laws that, G, uh, that God gave to his Israelite people in the wilderness. Each of those n other nine commandments is restated in the New Testament by Jesus. It's reaffirmed as, as good and, and right and binding as a moral thing we should do. The Sabbath is the one that isn't. And I think actually in, when we read um, in Exodus 16 that uh, the, the Sabbath is given as a sign between, between you, and, between God and his Israelite people as that covenant. I think that's part of what it's tied up in, that uh, this is a specific thing for these people. And like many elements of the Old Testament law, it's being fulfilled. Now, that is a, that is a debated, controversial issue. Um, other people see that differently. I wouldn't hold that against them. That's how I read it. But happy to chat more about that if you'd like to. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Then the next one along is... Um, I guess it's maybe a wee bit similar, but what is your view on the role of Sabbath for Christians today? Um, yeah, oh, sorry. Um, Sabbath, yep. So it's, I think people often use the word Sabbath to talk about a day of rest. Um, I think our Sabbath, that term, is fully met in Jesus. Um, uh, and actually reading, reading around this topic this week, I've been convinced that I'm going to stop using that word um, uh, to talk about like a day of rest. I think actually the, the New Testament talks about the Lord's Day. Uh, as, as a, uh, like today, when we come together and worship, and rest will be part of that. Um, I think generally rest is a, um, is a good pattern that is set out in creation for us as people. Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, uh, not man for the Sabbath. Um, so we, we, we are made to need rest, and that recognizes our dependence on him. Um, so it probably looks different for each person. I'd encourage everyone to think, are we resting? I'd encourage everyone to say, I'm going to come to Jesus as my Sabbath rest. Um, again, people see that differently. But yeah, do you have anything to add to that? I don't know. Well, I came a little bit prepared. I, I've brought a book that some of us have read, actually. <laughs> hey, I've, I've no, like I'm not getting anything from this, but it's a really good book and actually goes a wee bit against what you're saying, yeah. which I think is, is this yeah. idea of, of being theologically generous. And it talks about if God chose to rest, then should we also follow that pattern of resting? And it... it, con it um, translates the word Sabbath as stop and delight. And so are we stopping and delighting in what's, yeah. what's been done? And so there's actually, maybe it's not that so against really, mm -hmm. that's just a, another way of looking at it. Yeah. And I think what I'm um, thinking about what Ed's just said in this book is just actually, it's f up to us to go and, and dig deeper and find out what we, so we can then say with conviction, this is what I think, but still feeling that I can't judge you or you or you yeah. for what you're doing with your Sabbath and whether you shop or cook or make other people cook for you or whatever it looks like, it's got to come from the heart and, and how we love Jesus in that. Yeah. Uh, but it's, but I would recommend it. it's actually a really good book and some of us have been quite convicted by it. So, And de definitely definitely keep baking um <laughs> very important um but yeah no, definitely yeah. Uh, there's, there's a range of opinions if you want to i mean just on theological generosity there in the handout that i mentioned earlier you, if you haven't been to it you go to hopecityedinburgh.org slash notes the bottom of that handout um well first of all you can click email to email the notes to yourself and you've got it as a record um but bef under, above the email button i put loads of loads of extra resources um that are, are looking at this topic from different angles um Stuff I found helpful to wrestle with this. Um, videos, podcasts, articles, mm. um, a book. Um, so if you want to really wrestle with this, I'd encourage you to go there as a starter and then take it from there. As I say, this is an open issue. Um, it's not something that we should judge each other on, but yeah. we can discuss, definitely. Lovely. One last kind of 
thoughts that we should take away from this morning? Yeah, G- uh, sorry, sorry, Tom, I was too quick there. <laughs> Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, so come to him and reflect his mercy to others. Wonderful. Thank you so much.